So I'm so happy to have guest rock star Graham Hurd joining us today. Graham has more than 30 years experience in the mining industry. He's the geologist in charge at Rock Solid Seismic, which is an independent hard rock seismic and exploration consultancy in Perth, WA. So today he'll be discussing with us how to understand and utilize hard rock 2D seismic data in complex geological environments. So it's gonna be a great session. Please use the chat. You'll have the chance to jump off mute and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Graham, for joining. It's wonderful having you. Thanks, Jess. Um, so today's talks on understanding and utilizing hard rock seismic in, in the 2D data sense rather than the 3D for the time being. So what is seismic reflection data? In simple terms, it's just a visual representation of echoes. Um, echoes come from abrupt changes in density and or the speed of sound in the rock. And so it's a bit like, um, so we have to hit the, we have to put energy into the ground, sound, and we use a source like a vibrator or a big hammer, and we listen for the echoes with a buried microphone. The time taken for those echoes to return is a function of the distance from the source to the reflector and back to the receiver, and the velocity of sound in the rock. So you can think of it as yelling into a canyon to make an echo. The further away the canyon walls are, the longer the sound takes to get back to your ears. And through various methods, we can convert that time taken into an image that represents those echoes. And that's what we're used to seeing as seismic data. And then there's a, a depth. We've got to convert that time representation into a depth representation. And that's called time depth conversion. We'll talk about that at the end of it. So why use seismic data in mineral exploration? Yeah. Um, the scale in the investigation of 2D seismic is fairly similar to the magnetics and supports the interpretation of that class of data as well. So they're supplementary data sets that work quite well together. It gives us a depth, a depth perspective to that shallow data that we're used to seeing. So magnetics really only sees down with any sort of resolution to about three or 400 meters. And you can do an inversion model to deeper than that, but we're losing resolution when we go deeper than about 400 meters. So the seismic gives us that extra dimension that we're missing from all the other data sets we've got, including most drilling. Most drilling is only like 400 meters deep. It helps support the exploration hypothesis by reducing the uncertainty of those geological models and at the mineral system scale through to the prospect scale. So we've got good resolving data down to depth. And while it can be used as for some direct detection for mineralization, such as massive sulfides, it's, it more often delivers us an understanding of the structural framework that can host mineralization. And while we can use 2D seismic data to mitigate the risk of an expensive 3D seismic data set, it's also a very valuable data set in its own right. So junior companies can benefit from using uh, 2D seismic data where without actually blowing the whole but exploration budget on a large 3D seismic cube. So 2D is a cost-effective way of adding certainty to what we already understand. So those are the pros of seismic data. Well, what are the cons? Well, 3D seismic surveys are very expensive. In complex geology, 2D is hard to interpret in, interpret in isolation. Just trying to do it on a single 2D line or two 2D lines without using all the other data sets that are available to us, it gets very difficult to do that. Getting good reflection information from shallow depths can be expensive. We have to tighten up our spacing on, on the sources and receivers, and that can add extra labor to the cost. So getting good information at, at shallow depths is expensive. It's easy to get the decision wrong, um, jeopardizing the whole survey. So interpretation basically begins with survey design. When we, put, when we lay out our design, we're already setting ourselves up for what the interpretation is gonna be. So we have to understand the geometries that we're going to be surveying before we even start the survey. Uh, one of the cons is that most mining software is not good at utilizing seismic data. Um, it's, a, it's a type of data that hasn't been used in the minerals industry until the last 10, 12 years. And so the software companies basically lag behind, the mineral software companies lag behind. Now there's GoCAD and Geoscience Analyst and Micromine and Leapfrog, they all can bring in 2D seismic data. And so if you've got access to seismic data and you've got those programs, you can now start uh, using seismic data. And Geoscience Analyst is free. So straight away, you, you're ahead of the game there. What about the sources of seismic data? Well, government sources include Geoscience Australia and State Geological Surveys. So here, I've got just the um, GS Science Australia data sets. You can see they cover most of Australia. And this little part down here, we're seeing uh, the GSWA data sets that are also freely available. 
So we've got some pretty good data sets available to us without actually having to spend any money. There are petroleum industry data sets that are available and there's mineral exploration reports and not many companies actually have that sort of data in their exploration report. So that's of a lesser value to us. Quite often you'll have to reprocess that Geoscience Australia and the state geological data sets um, because they're processed for things that we may not be looking for. So reprocessing can cost about $250 to $500 per line kilometre, um, depending on the lengths and so on. So um, it's not that expensive to get it done. Or you can go out and acquire your own seismic data. So going out and, and getting um, seismic data now is actually pretty cheap. Um, so there's quite a few companies that are actually supplying the acquisition services now. And new data costs somewhere in 2D, costs somewhere between say $7,000 and $9,000 per line kilometre to acquire. And again, that's depending on the, the number of kilometres you're going to be doing and the mobilisation costs. And there's about a 10% on cost for processing that. If you do your own interp, then and hopefully by the end of the day, you will be able to do your own interp. Um, that's, that's a cost that you can wear yourself. So the process of using seismic data in minerals industry is you've got to start with an objective in mind. It's no good just getting data and hopefully it will answer your questions. It's not. You've got to come up with some problem that you have a solution for that seismic might actually work for. And then you've got to determine if seismic is going to be that, that solution. Um, and you can do that by using petrophysics or wireline logging. You should also compile all the things that you already know, so geological models, magnetics, drilling, mapping, NT, whatever data sets you've got that are going to be used uh, in the interpretation of the seismic data should also be available when you're designing the seismic data, a uh, seismic survey. Should also find out if there's any seismic nearby. That map that I showed before, you can get online and, and find out if there's um, any seismic data that actually goes through or nearby your, your tenements. You might already have seismic data without even realizing it. Run ray path models. So basically, get geoscience analysts. These are in the pro version of geoscience analysts. These are a, a ray path modeling system. I'll show you what that looks like a bit later on. And forward models, if you've got the availability to that, I do that in GoCAD, but there are other programs that can do it. Then you design the program, acquire the program, process the data, interpret the data, and then use subsequent drilling to inform and understand the seismic data and reinterpret if required. Because it's not, it's not a dead data set once you've got it. You can always reprocess it, or you can uh, add your knowledge that you've picked up by doing the drilling to that data set and say, well, I know what this reflector is now, so therefore I can use that information to help reinterpret the seismic data. So what, interfa what interfaces act as reflectors in the minerals industry? Well, of course, lith lithological contacts, as we've seen, um, that's what you've seen at university when you saw the oil stuff. We were looking at uh, sandstones and shales and whatever. All of those things are often valuable within the minerals industry. And over here, we have a, a log, a petrophysical log, where we're seeing amphibolites and pegmatites and uh, the acoustic impedance, which is the one that actually gives us the reflection, is showing a strong response to uh, the rock type. So we're getting a big jump between the acoustic impedance here and the acoustic lens here, where there's pegmatite and amphibolite. And so lithological contacts often work as very good reflectors. But the other thing that um, we see that we don't actually see in the oil industry is alteration zones. Anything that can change the specific gravity or the velocity of the rocks can give us, can possibly give us a, a physical response, a, a response we're going to see with the, with the seismic data. So alteration zones can themselves be reflectors. Brittle fracture zones around faults. Um, when we have fracture, fracture zones like we've got here, that changes the bulk velocity of that rock because instead of having a solid rock to go through, now there's little gaps to go through. So brittle fracture zones around faults can give us a change in velocity, which can give us a response in the seismic data. Shear zones, although they're not brittle fractures, shear zones often have uh, alignment of the minerals within them. And internally on minerals, you've got different velocities on different axes of the crystals. So if all the crystals are lined up in one direction, around the shears and they're not lined up in that direction elsewhere, then you're going to get a change in velocity associated with shear zones. Get localized foliation, again, sort of related to shear zones, but not always. Massive sulfide bodies, of course, um, they are very dense, so that changes the specific gravity. So massive sulfides can be good reflectors in, in seismic data. And about half of my clients are nickel 
nickel companies. They're looking for massive sulfides using seismic. Stopes, we can see underground workings. There's not much, there's not a much bigger change in acoustic impedance than going from solid rock to vacant ground to, to stopes. So stopes can be very good reflectors. So if we've got uh, workings in our area where we're doing the seismic, um, we can use that information as one of the, the, the tools in our, in our toolkit. And I'll show you how we do that later on. Underground development also works. Like what we saw with the, with the brutal fracture zones, underground development, when they're putting the, the drives into the ground, they're blasting. Those blasts put micro fractures through the rock. And so underground development can give us a very strong response in seismic data. So how do we unravel some of the complexity that we expect to see in, in the 2D seismic data? So 2D seismic gathers information from everywhere, not just below the line. We're seeing it from out here. We're seeing it from over here. It's coming from everywhere. So how do you unravel that? So anything that comes from away from directly below the acquisition line is what we call offline events. So we can, and I'll show you those a bit further in this presentation, but essentially anything that's not directly below the seismic acquisition line can be represented on the seismic, on the 2D seismic data as reflections. We just don't know where they're coming from at first glance. <clears throat> and that can add to a already complex story. So we might have very complex um, geology directly below it, but then when you add offline events, things can get pretty tricky. Can we remove them with processing? Well, probably. Geophysic geophysicists are pretty good at, at modifying data sets to give us what we ask for, but I think that's a mistake. They're giving us extra information about that 3D geology. They're real and we should be using them, not trying to hide them. So don't run away from offline events. They're actually very useful data sets. It would be to remove them would be like drilling for massive sulfides and then not running down hole at EM because we didn't want to know what's near the hole. These offline events can tell us what's around that size, that 2D seismic data set. <clears throat> and since we're imaging complex 3D geology, we need to interpret the data in 3D. Simply drawing lines on 2D sections is inadequate and will almost always be an incorrect interpretation of hard rock seismic data because we know that in many uh, complex environments where we get minimization, we've got very complex 3D geology and those reflections we're getting on the 2D seismic data are coming from all over the place. Putting lines directly on the 2D seismic data is not enough to interpret the seismic data. So let's go back to the start of designing a 2D seismic uh, program. We would come up with a geological model. This is what we expect to see. We might have this informed from our magnetics, from our drilling and from our mapping and underground workings if you've got them. And so we come up with a geological model that we use as our basis for making our survey. These are ray path. This is a ray path model showing where we would expect to get a response from a source, from a receiver right next to a source. So this is the normal to the surface, normal to this surface. So these are the faults that we're looking at in this particular model. And then on in this other, other part of the model, we've got stratigraphic surfaces, which are dipping the opposite direction. And so we've got the choice of putting a 2D line in this direction, which is going to image the faults, or a 2D line in this direction, which would image the stratigraphy. Now, in this project, the faults are altered and they are hosting gold. So we're probably going to choose the direction that gives us the best response in that direction. And so we're looking at these off-plane events, sorry, we're looking at these ray paths coming out towards the east in this situation. And so we would put our 2D line in that direction by choice. Then we would run a forward model to see what sort of response we're going to get from our assumed geological model. And then we go out and acquire the data. And I'd like to thank the Lunar Mining Corporation for letting me use this data set. And we can see that we're getting responses in the direction that we're expecting to see them. <clears throat> so how do we unravel that geological complexity during interpretation? Now, the key to understanding 2D seismic data is not to think of it as depth, but think of it as distance. The distance that we see from our reflection or reflector to our seismic line is represented as a depth on the seismic line. And so as long as things are directly below it, the depth equals the distance. But when things are off the plane of that seismic line, then we now have to think of depth, not distance. Sorry, we have to think of distance, not depth. <clears throat> 
So flat reflectors, everything's easy. And this is what we're used to seeing in the, in the oil industry and in paleo channel mineralization in the minerals industry. When everything's flat, our ray path model says that everything's directly below the seismic line and an illumination model also shows that the seismic line corresponds with the illumination model that we've got. And that's because the 90 degree rule that we're expecting is honored in flat seismic in, in flat reflectors in seismic data. And so when the illumination model aligns with the seismic line itself, we can, we can say that the reflectors are in the plane of the section. And so these are in plane reflectors. So if we have minimal dip, just a gently dipping thing, we don't find, we don't often find mineralization in this sort of environment, but we're leading into the steeper stuff. And so in, in slightly dipping reflectors, we're seeing in the dip direction, we're still seeing things in uh, the illumination model is lining up with the seismic data. And so we're seeing things that are in the plane of the seismic line. Now, if we go across that, if we go in the strike direction, we're starting to see the illumination model differ from the um, location of the seismic line itself. And steeply dipping reflectors will, will illustrate this a bit better. So let's move to that. Now, our seismic line that is in the dip direction still honors, we're still getting things in the on-plane uh, environment. So we're not, we're not seeing things off-plane when our seismic line is designed for the dip direction of that object. And so everything sits where it should sit. <coughs> Excuse me while I take a drink. But so here we've got our, everything's still in that 90 degrees um, orientation because we're in the dip direction of our, of our reflector. But what about when we go in the strike direction? Here's the reflections from this object over here, but the, the depth is totally wrong. And that's because we no longer have things sitting in that 90 degree um, orientation. And the illumination model suggests that if we were to put our source and receivers in this direction, we're going to see that dipping reflector in this location out here. It's gonna be represented as a depth at this distance, which is the same here. So this distance from here to here is this depth on the seismic line. And so we can play a little trick here and reinstate the assumptions of 2D seismic by rotating our seismic line so that we're back into that plane. And so that now we're back in plane and we don't have off-plane events coming from this particular object because we're back in that 90 degree rule. And so when I look through that, we're seeing that it's now matching up exactly as it should. All right, so the thing we can do to, to modify our interpretation or improve our interpretation is to rotate the seismic line so that it reinstates the assumption of 2D seismic data. All right, so in the dip direction, our seismic line and our illumination model are well aligned, no problems there at all, no offline events. But when we're looking, this is plan view, when we're looking down at our illumination model and our seismic line, seismic line down here, illumination model up here, we can see that that's now very much off the plane of our seismic line. And so dip direction, everything's on plane, not a problem. Strike direction, things are off plane. And when the dips are steep, we have a problem. What about reflectors with oblique dips? Well, we still have to think about these as a distance rather than a depth. So you can see here is our seismic line. Our illumination model shows that the illumination moves further away from the seismic line. And so when we look at our response from that, we're seeing that this reflector that we've got here appears to be shallower than here, but it gets closer to it as we get, as we get towards the end of the line. So up here, the illumination model says that we're close to the seismic line. And that means that we get a response that appears to be shallower. What about blind intrusions, things that you can't see um, from the magnetics or from your drilling? What are they gonna look like? Well, these are off plane. In this case, off plane, we never actually intersect this intrusion with the seismic data itself because everything's off plane. Our illumination model and our ray path model confirms that. And we start to see illumination coming through out, out over here at the bottom of this intrusion. And on the other side, we're going to see it at the top of the intrusion up over here. And so the, here's our illumination model. 
And so the response from that off-plane event shows up as this blob, even though it's not actually on the seismic data set. All right, so what about an on-plane intrusion, sort of? All right, so here we're seeing ray path models. We're seeing uh, illumination coming from over here for this one. Uh, as we get closer to it in here, we're seeing an illumination model that lights up here. So that's pretty close to the plane of the, of the seismic line. And so since we're not too far away from the seismic plane, we get stuff that's not far away from it. These deeper ones that are down here, um, these deeper ones are coming from a long way away at the far end away from us from what we're looking at here. So you can see these re responses coming from in the distance here. And so they're not always blind, sometimes they're not. Um, so here's our illumination model for that intrusion. And you can see it's reasonably close, so it wasn't too far away. Now, what about multiple dip directions? Here we've got three different competing um, targets for our 2D seismic. And so in this case, we've chosen the red reflector as our main um, objective. We want to image that most effectively with our 2D seismic. But we still have things coming from out to the sides. So what are we going to get when we look at that? This is much more closely aligned to what we're going to see in the real world in hard rock seismic. So we're going to see, we're going to see some things that are perfectly aligned, and that's what we hoped for. But we're also going to see things that are off the plane in two different directions. So here's our, I've called this a thrust. The, the uh, reflection from that thrust is closer to the seismic line than the depth at the seismic line, and so it looks shallower. And this intrusion that we're seeing out here doesn't even cross the seismic line at all. It would be a mistake to try and drill for this thing on this seismic line because it's in the wrong spot. We can't tell looking at the 2D seismic alone whether we're going to hit that from drilling or not. So we wouldn't plan drilling on 2D seismic. So here's the illumination model from that. One way to deal with it is to put in a line that is perpendicular to that. And so when we put in a line that's perpendicular to the first line, which is our main objective, uh, we can start to improve our interpretation. So two, two, two 2D seismic lines is usually going to be better than one 2D seismic line when you're trying to use 2D as your interpretation tool. It would be a mistake to try and rotate the seismic out to these because once we do that, um, yeah, we might be able to image the, the intrusion reasonably well, but straight away we've lost the on-plane relationship of this red reflector. And to go the other way, if we're looking at that fault out there, um, we'd get the fault in the right position, but again, we've lost the, the relationship of this um, red reflector to the reflections we're seeing in here. So you have to be aware of that when you're looking at these data sets, that rotating the seismic line isn't going to be a solution for every reflection on the 2D seismic. Asymmetric folding. <clears throat> Starting to look at some of the things that can cause issues when we're looking at 2D seismic data. Here we have an asymmetric fold and we put a 2D line in this location. Our ray path model shows that, uh, our illumination model shows that we're going to get a triple reflection from this single object in this case. And so when we do our forward model, we see three reflections coming from this one surface. You've got to be aware that multiple reflections can come from one surface when we have complex geology to deal with. It would be a, a mistake to interpret this as a south over north thrust because that's not what's happening here. Um, we, I am going to show you an example of this a bit later on in, in this presentation, but this response can happen in the wild. And if you would see that in the seismic data, you might end up um, mistakenly calling that a thrust and, or a south over north thrust. Now, in this environment where we do have asymmetric folding, there is thrusting going on, likely, and it's likely to be west over east thrusting in this case, because the steeper, the steeper limbs are on the eastern side of these folds. So if we put that second line in that's perpendicular to the first to resolve the unexpected reflection pattern, and then we put a ray path model and our illumination model together, we can see that ray paths are coming off up dip, as we expect. There's a gap in here where we don't have coverage out on the far end of the seismic line, on the eastern end of the seismic line. And that's what we see in this data set as well. 
And so we're not seeing any information coming from there because the seismic line didn't cover that. And we're seeing our reflection coming from shallower than the intersection line of that seismic line. But together, those two seismic lines give us a response that we can interpret. <clears throat> now we're going to look at Canana Bell here. Now this, this Canana Bell data is generated from public data. Um, I wasn't able to get the original data set from Canana Bell. Um, but we're using online, uh, sorry, we're using uh, a, a map that represents the input geology. We've got a map that represents the, the regional geology and our seismic line, which is a government data set. And so <clears throat> my geological model is based on, on pretty much on these data sets. And we're seeing, we're seeing a fold here. It's actually a fold, but it's a folded fold. And we're seeing the grave down grip out, grit out here and there's some porphyries in here, which are coming a bit later on. And so when we look at the seismic data itself, I was actually working at Canana Bell when we did this seismic data and I was flummoxed. I couldn't work out what the hell was going on because our 2D line went across the Fitzroy Fault. Fitzroy Fault should have been at about 1200 meters depth. And in fact, we saw some responses that looked a bit like the Fitzroy Fault, but it was at 750 meters. This seismic stuff's not gonna work. Here's our response from the model, and here is the acquired data set. When I do a forward model on that, we can see this pretty good, pretty good um, correlation between the forward model and the seismic data itself. So let's do that trick where we rotate the seismic data and put it back into the plane of the ray paths and introduce that porphyry back into it. And here we see that response from the geological model that I put together and the acquired data set when I've rotated it back into, into the correct alignment to represent these steeply dipping events. So that's one way you can use this data set. And it works very well when you've got consistently dipping or plunging in this case, um, geology. The fraction responses. So this is another trap for young players. Um, here we have some uh, planes that are truncated before reaching the surface. We have our illumination model showing that as we move further away from the seismic line, it's gonna look a bit deeper. But there's also this response that we see along the leading edge of the, uh, the model surface. And we see these in real life, and I'm bringing it up here because these do look like thrusts when you're looking at these in, the, in, in actual data sets. And so, we have our response, our normal reflection response here, and we have a diffraction response coming from the top of these things here. Now, you can see that in here. Now, as I said, it's distance rather than depth. So we have our, reflect, our, our reflector body comes up through here. The response from that reflection stops about here, and then the diffraction takes over here. The diffraction approaches the seismic line, and then it moves away from the seismic line, and it appears to go deeper. So these things that look like thrusts are actually just truncated reflectors. So you've got to be aware of those. And now this is the Nepean data set with very great thanks to Auroc Minerals for letting me use this data set. So here we have these truncated um, bodies of interbedded basalts and sediments and ultramafics. And when we look at this data set, I know it's a little bit confusing, but you can start to see these things. Here's my forward model of that data set. You can see these rollovers occurring in the data sets in through here. So these are the rollovers we get from diffraction signatures on the ends of planar reflectors. And then in the seismic data, you can see these rollovers occurring through here. Now, at first glance, when you look at this, you might say, oh, look, there's a, there's a thrust there. There's a, a fold nose happening there. Here's the fault going up through here. It's not. That's one of those things that you see as a diffraction rollover diffraction signature. The other thing that's important in this data set is the presence of a very major off-plane event. And so my interpretation of this data set was that we have an intrusion coming out through the side here, doesn't cross it, or if it does cross the seismic line, it crosses it at great depth. But the illumination model from this, from this interpreted intrusion gives us a response that's pretty much horizontal. Now, when you're seeing horizontal reflections in the gold fields of WA, something's wrong. 
because there's almost nothing that is horizontal in the gold fields. We're looking at very steeply dipping reflectors. As soon as you see horizontal or shallow looking things, you can start to think this is probably an off-plane event. Where is it coming from? And start investigating and looking for that. Uh, modeling a thrust system. I haven't got an example of this in this data set to show you a, a real life example, but what I do want to show you is the apparent extension of these, these reflective bodies beyond the ends of the um, truncating body, a thrust in this case. And so in, the, in this event where we're looking straight down at it, it's not so bad, everything looks okay. But then when we go in the other direction, the north-south direction through this, which is very much off plane, the response we get is to see reflections trunk or going through our, our thrust. Now, remember that it's distance, not depth. The distance of this thing is closer to the seismic line than the distance of these things are. And so we get reflections that appear to go through thrusts. They're not actually going through thrusts. We just have to remember that we have 2D data that we have to interpret. So a crooked line interpretation. Now, this is where things get really tricky. And when we're looking at GA data sets, there's lots of crooked lines. So bear this in mind when you're looking at the regional data sets, because they can give us some, some false indications. Now, this is a 2D line on a, on a single, that's a crooked 2D line on a single set of planar reflectors. There's these reflectors. And as we go around the corner, we're seeing things that are off plane interacting with things that are closer to being on the plane. So that's going to give us a really weird looking response in the seismic data, where it looks like there's a big fold going on there. It's not a fold at all. It's related to the geometry of our seismic line. And so here's a GA line from uh, near Q, and thanks to Golden State Mining for letting me use this data set. We see there's a large um, bend in the seismic line through here. The general strike of, of the geology in the magnetics shows that it's a pretty much north-south fairly parallel to this limb of this seismic line. Now, if we look at it from over here, we see this and it would be very easy for us to put in what we think is a fold nose on a thrust. But by looking at it in 3D, so I'm rotating around so that we're looking now from the south, that thing that looked like a fold nose is actually a planar event in that orientation. Now, something else to be aware of is this little response in through here. And this is one of those asymmetric fold type events that we saw before in the, in the forward modeling. So be aware of that as well. This is not a thrust coming out through here, not likely to be a thrust coming out through here because of that shape. That's likely to be one of these asymmetric folds. And now, so how do you unravel some of this? Well, if you've got some known information, for instance, in this case, we've got an underground, work, underground workings. Again, thank you to Waluna Mining for letting me use this data set. Here we have a series of stopes that have ray path models that come very close to this seismic line through here. And so when we look at that, that uh, underground working on the seismic line, we're seeing a very strong response that is quite coincident with it. So we can say that this response we're getting from here is most likely from this series of stopes that are in through here. And we know that that's likely to be very well imaged because our ray path model says that it would be. But what else can we see from this? So, by using that information, let's have a look at the other things that we might see in this data set. So we see a very strong response down here too. And that happens to be twice the distance from there to there to there. So this is likely to be a multiple. So you probably wouldn't want to drill that. You might keep an eye out for information in other locations that says that this might be important, but it's likely to be a multiple of this very strong reflector. And so you can probably ignore that. Now, I haven't shown you all the workings. There are other workings over here. And so the responses we're getting in this data set in this area are likely to be caused by these stopes. And remember, stopes are open, open areas, very strong seismic response we get from, from those. Uh, what about this line, this one down here? So here we have an off-plane, I'm going to show you what an off-plane event looks like in real data sets. And we know the location of this data set because this is a surveyed line. And so when we look at the data set that was acquired, you can see that these faults, there was a question this morning on Heather's one about being able to see steep 
steep reflections, these faults are you know, more than two kilometers down. So you can see very steep events at quite a long depth, provided your offset is sufficient. And they've done that here. So very good imaging down to, down to depths beyond two kilometers of these faults. Um, but what about uh, in the line that we saw across here? There's a response that we see just in this area down here. What is that coming from? Now, the geological model said that everything was steeply dipping in this direction for faults and in this direction over here for the stratigraphy. So if we're looking for, for reflections from faults, we're going to see them as steep events on this, on this uh, seismic line. But what are they going to look like on this line here? Well, we know that our, our ray path model suggests that we should be able to see things from over here on this seismic line. It turns out that this response we're getting down here, when we rotate this section back into the alignment of that ray path model, that response that we're getting is coming from the stopes in that area. And so we're seeing a pretty good correlation between uh, strong reflectors and stopes as an off-plane event on this line. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that when we see things dipping on with an apparent shallow dip to the north on this line, they are likely to be a similar orientation to that uh, north-south series of faults that are dipping to the east. And so when we're seeing these things in this direction, we can say, well, those are probably faults and we should keep that in mind when we're looking to do our interpretation on this data set. The other thing that is of note on here are these very faint lines in this direction. So you can see them through here, this orientation. Our Ford model says that these are the stratigraphic responses and these are the structural responses. And so when we look at those two things, we see the Ford model suggests that anything that's dipping to the north on this section is probably a fault and anything that's dipping to the, to the south on this section is likely to be stratigraphy. And so you can see these things in this orientation are probably going to be stratigraphy and this orientation is going to be structures. So we need to incorporate other data sets as well. Sometimes we don't have, in fact, most of the time, we're not going to have the option of looking at um, underground workings to give us a really good response on our seismic data. So let's have a look at magnetics. And this is from St. George Mining. This is the Mount Alexander. Um, deposit. This deposit is hosted by granite. So we're not expecting a very strong response in the seismic data at all in this, in this data set. And the, the uh, petrographic modeling suggested that, that was also going to be the case. So we're not going to get a very strong response here. That's okay. We've got some really good magnetics and some other data sets that can be used to help us with the interpretation. So here's the mag magnetics overlying three seismic lines. Now, this is a pseudo relief section. Now, the data itself, you're not seeing very strong reflections coming from the structures themselves, but we are seeing breaks in reflectors and we're seeing some increase in reflectivity in those orientations where we know that um, the geological model suggests that we see faults in this orientation. The seismic also showed that we had orientation in this, in this direction. So a set of conjugate faults could be built up from that. And it, show, it showed that the East northeast trending structures were dipping to the south, and the east west trending structures were dipping to the north. And so that gave the, the, the company another line of, in, of um, targeting that they could use. So, nearly at the end here, what about depth conversion? So, depth conversion is something that we get asked all the time. And it was even asked this morning on, on, the, on the, uh, the GeoHug presentation that Heather Shines did. I would suggest that you don't get too hung up on accurately depth converting 2D hard rock data set. It's fit for purpose that we've got to work within. So remember that just about everything that we're seeing in hard rock seismic in a complex environment is going to be off the plane. Doing a depth conversion on that is going to be near on impossible. It's not impossible, you can do it, um, especially if you've got um, some workings to work with, but don't get too hung up on it. Um, and the talk about a bit more. So a 2D data set close enough is often good enough, especially when we know that in most hard rock environments, we're basically dealing with 6,000 meters per second, plus or minus 10%. So the depth conversion can be done very simply by just saying, 
we're going to assume 6,000 meters per second for our velocity model and then running with that and seeing what we get. Quite often it's, it's within a few meters. When we put drill holes in to test information, we're pretty close most of the time. So don't lose sleep over depth conversion in hard rock seismic, especially in 2D hard rock seismic. It's not critical. We're going to be close enough if we assume 6,000 meters per second as our velocity. It's often impractical because these off-plane events dominate the seismic reflection data. So how far off-plane and what's the orientation of these reflections that we're getting in seismic data? How are you going to test those? Are you going to drill them along the ray paths that we modeled? It gets very, very tricky to be trying to, to do depth conversion using VSP, for instance. Uh, determining which reflection actually correlates with a drilled reflector is nearly impossible because, we, again, we don't really know how far off-plane these things can be. And then running a VSP, we can run VSP and it can be done. And that's vertical seismic profiling where you put geophones down the hole, put a source on the surface. But the, for that to be accurate in a very complex environment, you basically have to do 3D VSP. And that's potentially going to cost you more than what the 2D seismic survey is going to cost in the first place. Remember, 2D seismic surveys are now within the, the, the reach of most juniors. Anything from $50,000 to $200,000 will get you a pretty good seismic survey. So it can be done pretty cheaply. 3D VSP, it's going to add quite a lot to the cost of that. So think of it as a fit for purpose data set rather than an ab absolutely um, accurate data set. We wouldn't be trying to do uh, drill targeting off 2D anyway, and that's when you want to go to 3D. So if you, if you need to do drill targeting off seismic, you probably want to go to 3D. But if, if what you're going into 2D seismic, with is a concept of understanding what your geological framework is, you're not going to run into too many problems with, with depth conversion. You just have to be close enough to give you the ideas of what your geology is going to look like. And where it exists, infrastructure is probably the best time depth conversion tool we have in the minerals industry. It's something that we don't have in the oil industry. Minerals industry, we've got underground workings. We know exactly where those underground workings are. If we can see them in the seismic data, we don't need to worry about doing VSP. We've got perfect information about where things are in space. And if we can image that 2D, sorry, if we can image that infrastructure in our, in our seismic data, the depth conversion goes away in the vicinity of that, um, that workings. So conclusions. The cost of 2D seismic surveys are dropping. It's a good time now to be considering how those surveys might help your exploration project. It's not just a stepping stone on the path to an expensive 3D survey. It's actually pretty good data sets in and of its own right. You can do stuff with 2D seismic data that you don't need 3D for. A 2D seismic survey can help fill in that vital piece of the geological puzzle, and that's the third dimension. So we've got good information in our magnetics and our drilling to shallow depths and our mapping and geochemistry and gravity and all sorts of stuff. This data set, 2D seismic, can help fill in that, that piece of that puzzle. They aren't quite as difficult to interpret as you might have thought, provided you've got other supplementary data sets to work with. In complex geological environment, environments, off-plane events are the norm rather than the exception, and attempting to remove them would be a mistake because, in fact, they're actually very useful items. And we can use known features to inform our interpretations and depth conversions. So, so probably the big takeaway from this is that interpretation of 2D data must be done in 3D to, to be effective and useful. The ultimate product of a 2D seismic interpretation is a 3D exploration model. You can't just put lines on a 2D survey and then say, job done, because those lines are going to be in the wrong spot. So look, thanks. Hopefully now you won't be uh, chasing your tail, tying yourselves in knots, throwing your hands up in the air and running away from seismic. Um, we've got good information out there now. We've been doing it long enough now that we don't need to worry too much about 2D seismic being too difficult. It's not too expensive. It's useful data. Um, and certainly consider it, especially if, it's, if you've got it in your data set already as a free data from the government. Oh, and if you're watching online, watching this later on, please like and subscribe. Jess is always way too polite to put that into her videos, but I'm saying please like and subscribe to the GeoHub uh, YouTube channel. Um, great stuff on that channel. So thank you very much. That was awesome. Thanks, Graham. It was um, 
such a yeah good overview of all of that it's I'm sure it's gonna be super useful for people so thank you so much